You can grab your Bibles this morning and turn to the book of Hebrews. We're going to finish up chapter 1 today. One of the blessings of going through Hebrews is to help us understand the Old Testament, to understand how the Old Testament prophesied, predicted a future Messiah and what his role would be. So as we make it through Hebrews, and by the end of it, you will understand the purpose of the Old Testament. Why did they have the priesthood in the Old Testament? Why did they have the sacrificial system? How is it that this person who would come would be a king and a suffering servant? And we see that combined in the life of Christ. And so the writer of Hebrews, imagine, I'll say this again, imagine if all of you come from generations, generations of, you're, you're Jewish, and for generations, your family has been practicing, and, and you have too, carrying out, living by the Mosaic Law in the Old Testament. Your family went to Jerusalem three times a year. You did the sacrifices. You did all the pilgrimage. You were steeped in the Old Testament. And now that the Messiah has come and you've come to believe in him, you're like, how do we relate to the Old Testament? What do we still apply today? And imagine then if you start getting persecuted by your Jewish relatives, Jewish friends, your Jewish community, who do not yet believe that Jesus is the Messiah. And they're trying to call you back. They're saying you have left God's only way of salvation. That is living out the, the sacrificial system. Coming to the priesthood that's laid out in the Old Testament. And so the writer of Hebrews, how many would see that this is tempting? It would be very hard to leave that if you've been steeped in it. And I've been saying that you and I may not, we're not tempted in that way to go back to the Old Testament sacrificial system. But people all the time leave a profession of faith for Christ for sin. And we've been mentioning those. Some people will leave the Christian faith for sexual sins. Some people will leave the Christian faith because of the love of money. They don't want to serve God. They want to go and, and, and some of these things in and of themselves are, could be good things in and of themselves if they don't become idols, but they pursue them with an idolatry. So there are people that you know today that made a profession of faith at one time, but no longer walk with Christ. Maybe it was pressure from friends to come back to the old life. Maybe it was just, I don't want to live under God's rule anymore. I don't want to live by his word. And they depart. Well, the book of Hebrews is written for every person that claims to be a Christian. And the writer of Hebrews is trying to keep us to exalt Christ in such a way that nothing will tempt you to drift away from your profession of faith. Let me direct your attention before we begin to chat the warnings that we see in the book of Hebrews. So we'll begin this morning just with a reminder of where we're headed, a warning that all of us, the book of Hebrews is going to have a ton of encouragement. That's the purpose of the book, to encourage you to further your walk in Christ, to stay connected to him. But also through the book, he's going to give five, at least five different warnings. In chapter three, verse 12, he says, take care, brethren, that there not be any one of you an, unbelief, an evil, unbelieving heart that falls away from the living God. But encourage one another day after day, as long as it is still called today, so that none of you will be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. For we have, here's the key, we have become partakers of Christ if we hold fast the beginning of our assurance firm to the end. Meaning you have had a genuine saving experience in the past when you came to believe in Jesus Christ, that is going to be true if God bears in your life a persevering faith to the end. And the book of Hebrews is going to help us understand that even better. The book of Hebrews sees us on a journey, a race, that we're to continue until we meet the Lord. And so let's, let's begin in prayer. And I'm going to walk us through chapter 1, and we're going to actually finish chapter 1 today. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the gift of salvation. What that means to each one of us who have come to know the Lord Jesus in a personal and saving way. We call him Savior and we call him Lord. We are to submit to him, to follow him from the beginning of our conversion 
until we depart from this life and are with you. Father, help us to take these warnings to heart, to see the encouragement in this book, to stay true to the Lord Jesus, to confess him as Savior and Lord, to claim that he is deity, to claim that he is the long-awaited promised Messiah. And we look forward to when you're going to fulfill all of those prophecies. And Lord, we pray today, if there's anyone here that has never come to saving faith in Christ, that they would come to know him in a real and saving way as they listen to your word proclaimed. For those, Lord, here that are believers, we pray that you would draw them to yourself even closer, that you would bring conviction where needed and encouragement where needed. We pray all these things in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and all God's people said, Amen. Let's take a look at chapter one. We're going to finish chapter one. So if you haven't been with us, you're you're going to get a blessing, hopefully, today as we walk through together. So grab your Bibles. We're going to walk through together down to verse 13. In this chapter, the writer shows Jesus as the long-awaited divine Davidic king, meaning David in the Old Testament was promised that one day he would have an heir that would reign over God's kingdom forever. So if you remember in the Gospel of Luke, Mary was told that you were to give him the name of Jesus, and it is he, he's the one who is a descendant of David, who will rule over Israel forever. And so this is scattered throughout the New Testament as fulfilled in Jesus. And what the writer is going to do in chapter 1, let's open our Bibles and take a look. Verse 1, God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers in the prophets in many portions in many ways, so God in the Old Testament spoke at many different times through the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us in his son. And now he's going to give a description. Whom he appointed the heir of all things. That's Davidic. The Davidic son, this heir, is going to be one who inherits all things. Yet we see deity interchanged all the way through this passage. Through whom also he made the world. So we made a whole sermon on that Jesus is clearly called God because only God has created. So we see that Father, Son, Holy Spirit are all involved in creation. So we make a big deal out of that. Verse 3, speaking of the Son, the Son is the radiance of his glory, the exact representation of his nature. So the Son has the exact representation of the Father's nature, upholds all things by the word of his power, when he made purification for sins, we're going to see this developed in the book of Hebrews. This is his priestly role. He sat down at the right hand of majesty on high. This Davidic king is also a priest. This priest doesn't need a sacrifice for himself. In the book of Hebrews, he is the sacrifice. And by him becoming man and being our priest, he has purchased for us. He has won for us eternal redemption. That's how the book of Hebrews. So these first few, first few verses are really unfolding the outline of the rest of the book. Having become much better than angels, he's inherited a more excellent name than they. Now he's going to give a description of the difference between the Son and angels. For to which of the angels did he ever say, you are my son, today I've begotten you. That's Psalm 2-7. Remember that we said that was a, another prophecy about the Messiah. Fulfilled in Jesus' resurrection and exaltation. Because we saw that the Davidic sons, when they became king, God called them his son. So even though Jesus is the eternal son, always with the father before the world began, when he comes into this world and takes upon flesh, he's now the Davidic king. Once he dies on the cross and is raised from the dead, he is exalted and declared the Davidic son. He's going to be a father to him. He shall be a son to me, 2 Samuel 2, 7. Again, he brings the firstborn into the world. We looked at and did a whole sermon on the firstborn. This is Davidic also. Let all the angels of God worship him. So the Son is higher than angels because he is actually worshipped. We would only worship God, so another reference to deity. Angels are simply 
servants of the angels, he says, who makes angels winds and his ministers a flame of fire. But the son, he says, he actually calls God and he quotes Psalm 45. What could never be said of a Davidic king, they represented God. They could speak for God. They could judge for God. But they could not actually be called God in his nature. No one else in scripture is said to create or to be worshipped. So the psalm is fulfilled ultimately in the son. Take a look at what it says. But of the son, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. And the righteous scepter is the scepter of his kingdom. So this king is going to reign with righteousness. None of the kings ever did that fully. You've loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness above your companions. Take a look at verse 10, reference to deity. You, Lord, in the beginning laid the foundation of the earth. The heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. They will become like an old garment. And like a mantle, you're going to roll them up. Like a garment, they will be changed, but you're the same. Your years will not come to an end. This psalm in Psalm 102 could only be spoken of Yahweh, the God of the Bible, the God of the universe. And the writer of Hebrews is giving this to the Lord Jesus, is saying this is true of him. You laid the foundations of the earth. You remain the same. Everything else is temporal, connected with time. How many see this? But the sun is eternal. Which to the angels, to our verses today now, verse 13, and we'll finish today with verse 13 and 14. But to which of the angels has he ever said, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet? Are they not all ministering spirits sent out to render service for the sake of those who will inherit salvation? Angels are simply servants. The son is full deity with the father. The son is the divine Davidic king. Angels are simply servants. So what I want to spend my time on the rest of the time today is verse 13. I want us to go back. First of all, if you have cross references, where is he quoting from? Just to see if you're paying attention. Hello? Psalm 110. Verse 13 is quoting from Psalm 110. The most quoted verse in the New Testament is Psalm 110. We're going to see how Jesus uses it. We're going to see how Peter uses it on the day of Pentecost. So to this, this is said of the son, sit at my right hand until I make it your enemies a footstool. So, you know, this is re in reference to what? A divine Davidic king. This is messianic. This has to deal with uh, the Davidic covenant, that one would come from him that would rule as, as king. But this can't be just a mere human, as we're going to see. So let's turn over to Psalm 110. Let's take a look at Psalm 110 quickly. So we have seven quotes from the Old Testament that are applied to the Lord Jesus. And you see this in the gospel accounts as well. One of the things that many Jewish people stumble over in coming to faith in Christ is because so many Old Testament texts speak of the Messiah as a king reigning over the nations. And they look at the Lord Jesus and they say, look, he was despised and, and he was crucified. And what they miss is that the Old Testament also spoke that the Messiah would be a suffering servant, Isaiah 53. They fail to see that the Messiah would be priestly, that there's actually two comings of the Messiah. And so those who embrace Jesus as Messiah understand that. They come to understand the Old Testament spoke of two different comings of the Messiah. Sorry, you're, you're in Psalm 110 and you're waiting for me. Good. Psalm 110. It says it's a Psalm of David. The Lord says to my Lord. Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. David is getting in 
on a divine conversation. We saw that in Psalm 45, God speaking. David here is has a role of a prophet. And he hears Yahweh saying, the Lord, see, capital L-O-R-D, the Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. The Lord will stretch forth your strong scepter, a scepter. Imagine if I had a, a scepter here, a, a ruling scepter. If I had a throne and you got a king, and this king rules with power and authority. He's got this scepter that represents his authority. He's going to rule in the midst of his enemies. Your people will volunteer freely in the day of your power and holy array from the womb of the dawn. Your youth are to you as dew. The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever. According to the order of Melchizedek, this is going to come up in chapter five. The Lord is at your right hand. He will shatter kings in the day of his wrath. He will judge among the nations. He will fill them with corpses. He will shatter the chief men over a broad country. He will drink from the brook by the wayside. Therefore, he will lift up his head. Folks, this is the word of the Lord. Can you say thanks be to God? This is a prophecy that is fulfilled in the Lord Jesus. This is a prophecy of a king that they were waiting for throughout the Old Testament. Who is this one? And I want to show you now how Jesus takes the psalm. So turn with me to Matthew's gospel, chapter 22. Matthew 22. I want to show you how Jesus understood this psalm. And then we're going to come back to the writer of Hebrews. Matthew 22. Now, Matthew 22, this is right. This is Passion Week. He's in Jerusalem. The Pharisees and Sadducees have been questioning him all day trying to trip him up, trying to trap him, setting traps. So they're asking questions that they can entrap him with. And so he decides to ask them some questions. Let me give you a riddle. Are you ready? Imagine, can I call you guys Pharisees and Sadducees? I see your piercing eyes looking right up here. Now, while the Pharisees, verse 41, were gathered together, Jesus asked them a question. How many would say it's fair if people ask you questions for you to ask them some questions? Don't ever play the game when somebody wants to ask you questions, but they don't allow you to ask questions. How many see that? You got to call that kind of stuff out on the carpet. Jesus was perfect in his wisdom and how he handled this. So he says, verse 42, what do you think about the Messiah? Whose son is he? They said to him, the son of David. How I many would say they were right? So, and speaking of the Messiah who's to come, whose son is he? When they say David, David, listen, David lived a thousand years before this, a thousand BC. So the Jews of Jesus's day, what were they expecting? They knew that the Old Testament was prophesying a Davidic Messiah, that the Messiah is going to come from the line of David. And so Jesus asked them a question, and they got it right. But now he throws a riddle to them. He said to them, Then how does David in the Spirit call him Lord, saying, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I put your enemies beneath your feet. Notice what Jesus says. He attributes the psalm to David. How then does David in the Spirit Call him Lord. This is brilliant. This is brilliant. I'd love to see this in heaven that we get a DVD or we can just push play, go into this room and actually see this stuff replayed. How many would love to? I, I hope heaven is like that. You know, I mean, because we can't create. I don't care what show you like. Chosen is out now and there's others. The Gospel of John. I thought that was a great rendition. But I want to see the actual thing, don't you? Have you ever looked like a deer in headlights? Like, how do, how do we answer this? What is Jesus trying to do? He's trying to show them. Have you thought deeply about what David is saying? The Lord said to his Lord. 
So this the Messiah has to be divine and yet human. He is going to be humanly speaking from David's line. The apostle Paul says that in Romans chapter one. According to my gospel, he's a descendant of David. Paul mentions this. This is something that you must believe that Jesus is a descendant of David, humanly speaking. Chapter nine of Romans, he says, from the Jewish people, we get the covenants, the law, the glory, all of this. And then we get the Messiah, according to the flesh, who is also God over all, blessed forever, Romans 9, 5. Jesus is both divine, full deity, full humanity, the son of David. Only someone who is fully divine and fully human could actually atone for sins. That's where we're going in chapter 2. Jesus was made a little lower than the angels by taking upon flesh so he could redeem you and I, so that he could bring many sons and daughters to glory. Folks, this is divine drama that we're reading about when we, we pull the scripture together and see what in the world is God doing. So how many would agree 100% Jesus is claiming that Psalm 110, divinely inspired, is about him? All throughout the Gospels, let me just say this, do a search on this. They call him Son of David all the time, and he never rebuked them. Son of David, have mercy on us. Accepted it all the time throughout his ministry. Paul makes it a point to say that Jesus is the descendant of David. Now let's turn over quickly to Acts chapter 2. Then we're going to go back because I want to answer the question, when will this take place? When will all of his enemies become a footstool? Can you explain that? So Acts chapter 2, so the day of Pentecost, remember Peter denied the Lord three times. Now Peter's fully restored. That was the gospel of John. Jesus restored him. Peter preaching on the day of Pentecost. Chapter 2, verse 29. They already ta- In chapter 2, he's already talked about Jesus being handed over. Take a look at verse 23. This man delivered over you by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God, you nailed to the cross by the hands of godless men. But God raised him up again. For the sake of time, go back and read chapter 2 sometime. For the sake of time, let's look at verse 29. Brethren, I may confidently say to you regarding the patriarch David that he died and was buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. And so because he was a prophet and knew that God had sworn to him with an oath, to seat one of his descendants on the throne, he looked ahead and spoke of the resurrection of Christ. He was neither abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh suffer decay. This Jesus God raised up again, to which we were all witnesses. Therefore, having been exalted to the right hand of God, having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured forth this which you both see and hear. For it was not David who ascended into heaven, But he himself says, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. And then they're pierced to the heart. 3,000 people get saved that day. Can you imagine? You guys help crucify Jesus. And now Peter's declaring, and, and the Holy Spirit is piercing your heart calling you to repent and to believe in the Lord Jesus. And when you confess Jesus, this is all the way through the book of Acts. If you come to know Christ today, what is the very next step you need to take? Baptism. As you read through the book of Acts, when somebody confesses the Lord Jesus as Lord and Savior, they get baptized all throughout the book of Acts. Now let's turn back over to the book of Hebrews. So Jesus uses Psalm 110. Peter uses Psalm 110. The writer of Hebrews is using Psalm 110. When will this take place? Chapter 2, verse 8 says this of Hebrews. You have put all things in subjection under his feet. For in subjecting all things to him, he has left nothing that is subject to him. But look, notice this. But now we do not yet see all things subjected to him. It's the already not yet. Positionally, all things in the future are going to be under his feet. Although right now, right now, let me ask you, are all things put under his feet? 
experientially? No. Do we still have anarch anarchy in the world? Do we still have 70,000 Christians locked up in North Korea simply because they own Bibles or because they were caught praying? Is that still happening? The North Korea are enemies of the gospel. The leaders, those who have locked up 70,000 Christians sitting in prison year after year after year, I would say those are enemies, wouldn't you? Listen, when you go against God's righteous rule, you are not acting in accordance in submission to him. If the world was in submission to him, we would have millions of abortions worldwide. Here in America, where we actually get to vote for our leaders, people still vote for people who believe it's right to kill children in the womb. Let me ask you something. Would you vote for anybody who believes in killing two-year-olds? Do we have any two-year-olds here today? If we have a president running and says, I believe in killing two-year-olds, I think it's okay to kill two-year-olds. How many would say, ah, I can't vote for him? Folks, from the beginning of time, none of Israel's kings were perfect. And I'm not gonna, I'll get a little bit political here in this sense. I'll tell you why. Because if we say we want a righteous ruler, this is how I look at any political position that I have to vote for. Which one is going to promote the most righteous standard, the way God looks at life? So I already know if none of Israel's kings were perfect, we're never going to have a perfect person running for any kind of office, whether it's a mayor or a governor or anything in between. But I have to ask this when I go to a voting booth. Here's, here's how I look at my conscience. If Jesus is going to rule in righteousness, and he will, and his scepter is one of righteousness, then how can I, as one of his disciples, be for things that are totally against his will? And I can't think of anything. I'm, yes, I, I'm on a soapbox for a second. Because you know what? I look forward to when this king returns, to where he puts an end to the slaughtering of the most innocent among us. I look forward to when he comes and reigns in his second coming and he puts an end to dictators all around the world that go against his will. I look forward to when he comes and rules and reigns and there will not be any anarchy anywhere in the world like there is today. See, I wonder if we long for this future reign of Christ in the second coming. I wonder if God is going to allow us to get so sick of sin to say, are all governments are broken. All people, we live in a broken world. Lord Jesus, come and make things right. Or do we just get in a mindset that eh, this is the way it's always been? Let me just say, as we read Hebrews chapter one, do you long to say, when is this going to happen? How many are ready for him to have everything subjected under his feet for those who aren't going to willingly say, I surrender. I've been a rebel in your world. See, I mean, right now, you're either a rebel or you're in his kingdom. I was a rebel for 24 years. So what's going to happen? I'll tell you what's going to happen. I want you to picture a football game. The football game is going to get really bad for us. Because if you're thinking that the Lord Jesus, right now, the Father is continuing to make his enemies put under his footstool. Therefore, things are going to get better progressively. That would not be a great picture of what you see in Scripture. What you see in Scripture is there coming a time in the future. We don't know if we're that generation or not. But the Bible says there is a generation that will see the rise of an Antichrist figure. Second, Write this down, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. This time has not happened yet. The Bible predicts that there will be one who will bring lawlessness into the world. That doesn't happen until right before the coming of Christ, because it is at the coming of Christ when he comes and sets up his kingdom. See, there's going to be a kingdom on earth that is going to make war against Christians. The book of Daniel and the book of Revelation says that Christians, it's going to look bad. It's going to be like fourth quarter, we're down by a ton of points. And then with a two-minute warning, when everything's dark, out of the black sky comes this brilliant bright light of the glorious second coming of Jesus. That's basically how I look at how this is going to take place. 
So I want you to turn for a second over to Matthew's Gospel, chapter 24. I just want to show you a couple scriptures. A couple scriptures. Matthew 24. Jesus warned, thankfully, about what would take place someday in the future, that there will be these false Christs and false messiahs. Please go back and read Matthew 24. He says there are going to be those that are misled, saying that I'm the Christ, chapter 5. See, see to it that no one misleads you, chapter 24, verse 4. Many will come in my name, saying I'm the Christ, and will mislead many. You're going to hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you're not frightened, for those things must take place, but it's not the end yet. So he gives this, he lays this out. There's going to be a great tribulation, verse 21, such as not ever occurred since the beginning of the world until now, or ever will be. Look at verse 29. But immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be dark and the moon will not give its light and stars will fall from the sky, meaning there's going to be a cosmic disturbance. The power, the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Look at verse 30. Here it is. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky. All the tribes of the earth will mourn. They will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky with power and great glory. He will send forth his angels with a great trumpet. They will gather together his elect from the four winds, from one earth, from one end of the sky to the other. How many see this? This is Psalm chapter 1, verse 13, starting to be fulfilled. The writer of Hebrews chapter 9 says Jesus came the first time to deal with sin. But the second time he comes has no reference to sin. So Jesus in the second coming right here is going to use his angels as his servants. That's what chapter 1 verse 14 says, right? Of Hebrews. They are sent out as what? Servants for those who are going to inherit salvation. Here they are used to gather his people as he returns. Where's he returning to? Where was David's throne? David's throne was Jerusalem. Where's he coming to reign? Look at chapter 25 with me, verse 31. This is Jesus. When the Son of Man comes, by the way, Son of Man is a reference from Daniel chapter 7, verse 14. The Son of Man who has a kingdom and a people. So you, if you want to go back, that's where the Son of Man language comes from. It's messianic as well. A kingdom has been given to him. But look what it says, verse 31. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his what? Glorious throne. Where's he at right now? He's on the throne in heaven, exalted, right hand of the Father. When he comes again with all of his angels with him, notice they're his servants sent out to do his bidding. He's Here he comes as a righteous king, and he's going to sit on his glorious throne. Folks, I hope, I wonder if we've lost that desire to see the second coming, even in our day. Even in our day. Do you long for that? Are you sick and tired of a world gone astray that rejects God, that mocks God? Can you imagine a country that can lock up thousands of Christians simply because they're holding a Bible like you are today? Simply because they were uh, caught praying? Now China is increasing their persecution, destroying churches, persecuting pastors, throwing them in prison. There's some Muslim countries where you cannot convert from being a Muslim to a Christian. If you do, you could get the death penalty. How many would say, I want that to end? See, some of the reasons why we don't long for the second coming of Christ is because we love this world and we don't see it the way God sees it. If you're apathetic today for this fulfillment to be taking place, for all of his enemies to sit under his feet, it's probably because you're apathetic. Because you don't, we don't actually see the world as wicked and evil as it really is. We should want all of God's promises to be fulfilled. 
I want you to say, Lord Jesus, as long as I'm here on earth, I want to do what I can to see justice in every area prevail. I just happen to pick pro-life because for me, nothing is what's most basic. I mean, if you don't have the gift of life, you have no of the other benefits. Somebody see this. Are there other justice issues in the world? Absolutely. But to be dismembered in the womb seems to be barbaric. How many would like to see that come to an end? Amen. It will come to an end. Jesus will put that enemy under his feet. One last text. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. To see how this is also fulfilled, Paul talks about it in 1 Corinthians 15. Uh, I do apologize. I said that was the last text. It's not. Of course not. Uh, I slipped up there. Verse 23. Speaking of the second coming of Christ. But each in his own order. Christ, the first fruits. After that, those who are Christ. So he's talking about the resurrection. In context, he's talking about um, being raised from the dead. Those who are in Christ are going to be raised, but they're going to be raised each in his own order. Christ is the first fruits. He was the first one raised. After that, those who are Christ win at his coming. Then comes the end when he hands over the kingdom to the God and Father, when he's abolished all rule and all authority and power. Look at verse 25. For he must reign until he has put what? All his enemies under his feet. And the last enemy that will be abolished is death. So listen, as you're thinking about Jesus having enemies under his feet, he's sitting on a throne. How many of you sit in a chair and your feet do not touch the floor? You have that happen? Then you're really short, right? Right? Imagine somebody sitting high on a throne and they have a footstool for their feet to rest on. But this footstool is the king's enemies. What, what it's showing is complete, what? Authority and rule. That's the picture. And Paul gives us, Christ is going to come. He's going to reign. But what is the last enemy? Death. So let's close. And I do believe that. I, I, am, I am holding my word now. Turn over to Revelation chapter 19. This is how it's going to be fulfilled. Jesus has not yet fulfilled all of his messianic promises. He came, offered a sacrifice, exalted at the right hand, sitting there, but he's going to return. And he's going to sit on the throne where David sat. He's going to sit in Jerusalem. Chapter 19 of the book of Revelation. You might want to write down chapter 11, verse 15. I've referenced that many times. They're waiting for the Messiah to come and to rule and reign, to make all the kingdoms of this world be submitted to him. That's chapter 11, verse 15. Write that down. Chapter 19 is all about the second coming. He comes back as king of kings and lord of lords. He's coming back as on a conquering stallion, waging war. He has a rod of iron in his hand to submit the nations. Chapter 20, uh, chapter 20 if you turn over to chapter 20, I do believe in a thousand year reign of Christ. That's what chapter 20 is all about. This king is going to reign physically. So if you want to read more about that, read chapter 20. And now let's get to chapter 21. So that's how the king is going to, when he comes back, he's going to rule and reign. But remember what Paul said. He must reign until the last enemy is put under his feet. And Paul said, what is that last enemy? Were you listening? Death is an enemy. How do you know? Because the scripture says. The last enemy. How many of you know that enemy is still working its way throughout our humanity? Well, take a look at chapter 21 with me. Revelation 21. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth passed away, and there's no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride adorned for her husband. 
I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men. He will dwell among them. They shall be his people and God himself will be among them. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will no longer be any death. There will no longer be any mourning and crying or pain. The first things have what? Passed away. He's making all things new. These words are faithful and true. How many see this great drama unfolded in scripture? We have a good creation. All things good. You have the fall, chapter 3. The book of Romans, chapter 5, says, Since that fall, there has been sickness and death working its way ever since then. Right? Death is looked at as reigning as a king, conquering people. God, in his plan of redemption, sends the Messiah, right? Divine Davidic king. Prophesied to David that one is going to sit on your throne and he's going to reign forever. So what's Jesus doing right now? Well, I'll tell you what he's doing. He's conquering rebel hearts like mine and yours. Because right now he has a spiritual kingdom. And he's gathering people right now from every tribe, tongue, and nation. I'm wondering if you're submitted. Turn. You don't have to turn because I said, I, oh, man. Would you forgive me? Again, I'm glad you guys are so merciful. I'm so glad I have a forgiving people to preach to. <laughs> Romans chapter 5 says this. That you and I were once enemies. I got to close with this because... Right now, we can be a part of his kingdom. Jesus said, there are drunkards and prostitutes coming into the kingdom before you Pharisees. Why? Because they recognize their brokenness and their need. Jesus said that. You got to see that you're sick. You got to be able to admit that you're a sinner in need of a physician. Broken people, I find, can admit that. Prideful people must be humbled to see that they need a savior. Romans chapter 5. Let me close with this. Romans chapter 5. I love this. Much more, having now been justified by his blood, declared righteous by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. For Listen to this. For while we were enemies, 